Good afternoon and welcome to the Westchester Publishing Services webinar, How Publishing is Adapting to a Work from Home Model. And I broke it already. Um, my name is Nicole Tomasi and I'm Westchester's Marketing and Conference Manager. Michael Jensen, Westchester's Director of Technology, is also joining me this afternoon and he will share his perspective later on in our discussion, as well as answer some of your questions during the Q&A session. Paul Krakow, Westchester's president and CEO, along with Tyler M. Carey, Chief Revenue Officer, are also with us today. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Your microphones will be muted for the duration of the webinar. You can enter questions at any time in the lower right-hand portion of the Q&A panel, which is accessible from your toolbar, which is at the bottom of your screen. You may need to hover with your cursor and the uh, toolbar should come up for you. Uh, we have a lot of great information to share with you, and the main portion of the presentation should take about 30 minutes. We understand that not everybody will be able to remain on for um, the entire Q&A portion, which may go another five to 10 minutes past that, but we will try to answer as many questions as possible, and we will contact you after the webinar to answer any questions we don't get to. You will also be emailed a copy of the presentation, including all questions that were answered. For those of you who aren't familiar with Westchester, the business was started in 1969, and we have been a US-based employee-owned company since 2014. We provide pre-press editorial and production services to more than 200 clients on over 4,000 book, journal, and white paper publications annually. We have offices in Danbury, Connecticut and Dayton, Ohio, as well as internationally in Stratford-upon-Avon, UK, and Chennai and Noida, India. Our Westchester Education Services Division, based in Dayton, provides services as far upstream as educational content development for K-12 public and private school print, multimedia, and ed tech publishers, adult and career tech training, as well as English language training for publishers around the world. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists, who will share tools, strategies, and useful ideas along with discussing the challenges they and their staff are encountering in making this transition. Terry Colosimo is Westchester's Director of Operations, overseeing our production teams based at our US and India facilities. Hi there. Evan J. Gray is the President and Chief Content Officer of Westchester Education Services, leading our business development and market expansion efforts for this division. Kev Breyerman Hello. is the Publisher and Executive Vice President of Publishers Weekly, the international news platform for the book publishing industry. He's been in publishing for more than 30 years, working at both trade and consumer magazines in strategic planning, business development, and strategic partnerships. Hello. Kathy Felger is the Publishing Operations Director for Princeton University Press, responsible for a team of 25, including editorial production, manufacturing, digital production, metadata, and ebook staff. Hello. Rich Portalance is the founder and CEO of CareerPath Mobile, a milestone-based tool set for all co-curricular groups to create and connect with the students they serve and for businesses looking to recruit students to engage in meaningful ways. Hey there. And finally, Andy Wilson is Global Director of Media Technology at Dropbox, helping teams to focus on the workflows and tools that really matter, removing complexity from production processes publishing and bringing new opportunities to create more collaborative workspaces. Hi everyone. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Terry, who will begin by discussing recent measures she has put in place with our staff at our Danbury and India facilities, along with the challenges and opportunities these changes have presented. Terry? Thanks, Nicole. Hi everyone. Um, over the last 10 years, I've had to implement emergency plans in on four occasions, twice in the US and twice offshore. The planning that time was reactionary. It occurred after the fact. We had to determine what were we gonna do now that power's out for four days, or we've now had destructive flooding um, in Chennai. How are our staff gonna get to the office? The difference this time is that we've had a window, though a slim one, um, to put policies in place and prepare for three of our offices needing to go remote. Our Dayton office already is home set up, and Kevin will address that in a moment. But the majority of our staff in Danbury and Chennai had never worked from home. So it became clear to us that 
one of the first measures we really needed to put in place was to conduct a technology survey. Under Michael's direction, uh, our teams in India and in Danbury, our technology teams, they worked together to determine what equipment did staff have at home? Did they have internet? Was their inter what was their internet speed like? And what programs did IT have to share with them so that they would be able to work effectively? By doing that before we set up remote, we were able to determine what equipment we needed to send home with them and what did we need to purchase in advance of them going home so that we were able to have them work effectively. It also allowed us to assess individual staff requirements. If an individual simply was not going to be able to work effectively because they didn't have that keyboard that they have at the office or they couldn't access one file on their local machine, we figured let's get them what they need so that they could work effectively, even if it wasn't necessarily within the contingency plan of how we were planning to work. Next, we determined what workflows had to change and what needed to stay the same in order for us to continue to move effectively. And one of the workflows that, at least in Westchester, is we still were very much paper-driven and folder-driven, physical folders moving from one department to the other. And for us, it became clear that in order for us to still get information to people, we really needed to move those folders into an electronic format. So key documents and emails were either moved to newly created mailboxes in Outlook or links were provided directly to files that were stored in Dropbox. And as procedures needed to change, we've had to make sure that that information is central for staff. We've relied on Dropbox paper in the office even before we moved to this remote environment for documentation like instructions, um, for loading TeamViewer or remote desktop. And we've been using Dropbox paper so staff can provide feedback on these procedures now that we've put them in place. But paper's not gonna necessarily um, resolve the communication that you need to have with your staff. We've been having more meetings with them, touching base with them to see what's working and what's not working. And we've needed to calibrate that as we've gone along. So even though we have paper, we still need to have that constant interaction with the teams. And as I mentioned earlier, some procedures needed to stay the same and some needed to change. The ones that needed to stay the same really affected how we do our services workflow. We couldn't say, well, those pages are left at the office. I can't perform my style check now. So in moving to paperless, we digitized all the projects that our production editors, or as we call them, PEs, um, we, we digitized all of them for them. So if they had pages that were sitting aside for hard copy from authors or freelancers, we got them to them in advance of working remote. So now they were able to easily access their projects as well as their production managers to have the flexibility to move a project if they needed to. And because many of our clients, the authors, our freelancers, and even some of our uh, publishers that work with us on the comp side, we, they needed to go paperless as well. So we had to educate clients and explain to them how to work electronically as they had not done so in the past. We've modified our stationaries going out to authors and freelancers, um, not offering an option to physical mail right now at this time. And we've also offered them um, cheat sheets or a PDF showing them how to annot use the annotating tools in Acrobat. And for some, we've even suggested purchasing scanner, all-in-one scanners and copiers or using their local copy senators, centers so that they could get that information to us if they've had large um, projects that they needed scanning. So in doing that, we've, we found that our publishers, our clients, they're following, they're having the same challenges we are. And we're using this time to talk to them, figure out the challenges, and also see these as opportunities. As I could say, the last time 
we had our no-name storm or Hurricane Sandy, many of the procedures we put in place stayed because the contingency planning worked. And you need to use these opportunities and say, okay, we're making the best of this. We're communicating with our staff. How are we going to continue to go forward with it? So embrace the flexibility and just good luck, everyone. <laughs> Um, I'm going to pass this over to Kevin now, and he can talk more about how working at home from the Dayton office is very different than what we've had to do because they were able to build it from the ground up. Take it, Kevin. Hello, all. Thank you, Terry. Um, so, so as Terry noted, the Dayton office was remote from the outset, mostly because it started with me, and I'm I'm remote. I'm in Dayton. Um, and so we had a lot of challenges in trying to figure out how to build this workspace. Um, you know, the other challenge for us was we wanted to make sure we hired the best talent. And this is going to be surprising to a lot of folks. Uh, folks who live around the world are not necessarily interested in moving to Dayton, Ohio. Uh, so we you know, really looked from the beginning to say, all right, how do we set up an infrastructure that will allow us to bring folks on remotely? Um, and we used a, a variety of tools and still use a variety of tools. Um, the biggest piece was re-examining the way we looked at server structure and how we access files. Um, and uh, and we, we settled on Dropbox as a solution for that, which Andy will um, talk a bit more about. Um, we use Zoom um, you know, for face-to-face um, -face meetings uh, and for you know, telecommunication. And then we have a variety of other tools. Uh, we use Shortlist to, to manage our freelancers, and we use Podio to build out um, financial management systems. All of this being done with the idea that from day one, we wanted to ensure that we could bring resources on who did not necessarily need to live in, in Dayton. Um, one of the biggest challenges, and I've been working remotely more or less for 13 years now, um, and one of the biggest challenges that I found is not so much about the infrastructure. That is a one-time challenge that you find a solution and, and you generally solve it. It's really um, making sure that your employees, that you're communicating and building a relationship with your employees. Uh, it's different than walking over and talking at the water cooler. Um, and so it really changes the way you're thinking about communication making sure that you have regular check-ins, um, knowing when to turn an email into a meeting. Uh, we kind of have a rule that if an email goes, you know, three or four, more than three or four responses and it's not resolved, look, let's just have a 15-minute meeting and, and talk through it. Um, and then doing uh, the virtual face-to-face -face through, through Zoom. Uh, what I've really found as a manager is also trying to understand the people you're working with or who work for you and knowing some of your resources need more check-in than others, and so making sure that you've got the resources who need the most check-in, you've got established times so that they can understand and, and, and predict when, when you'll be checking in with them. Um, and then finally, just dealing with the, the work-life balance, um, it is a different model working from home, and we'll get into this a little bit, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's very tempting, and this happened to me in the first years that I did this, where you think, okay, well, I'm up, there's no commute, I'll just jump in and work. And 13 hours later, you haven't gotten up and left your desk. Um, and it takes a little while to change your own personal mindset to, to say, hey, you know, if I were in an office, I'd go get coffee or I'd go talk to a coworker. So it's all right at home to get up and, and put a load of laundry in or go for a walk around the block, let the dogs out. So, um, you know, and also giving yourself permission to turn off your availability. If your office is set up in your bedroom, like a lot of people's uncertain are, um, it's kind of tempting just to work all the time and um, you'll burn out pretty quickly if you do. So for you and for your employees, encouraging them to set some boundaries as to when they'll be available um, and, and not available. Kevin, thank you for those uh, great pointers. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Kev Breyerman, who uh, again is publisher and executive vice president of Publishers Weekly. And he's going to share some insights with us. Um, but actually, before I do that, I'm sorry, Kev, I just want to kind of summarize, um, you know, some of the key considerations that uh, Terry and Kevin had gone over. And uh, don't worry about jotting these all down. We're going to send this out to you um, um, after the webinar. So um, some of the important things are be sure that you're collecting cell phone numbers for all your associates and to circulate that list within your teams. Um, also, 
centralize the documentation, such as the phone numbers and other processes, so that it's easily accessible to everybody who needs it. Um, you also should keep in mind how many associates will be accessing um, documents on company servers and systems um, that they might need to print at home. Um, other things to think about, um, as Terry had touched on, is you know how will your associates mark up and communicate um, edits and comments to manuscripts and documents. And um, as she uh, may have mentioned, uh, there is, you know, there is documentation from Adobe Acrobat um, that they've put together and also something more specific that we have available uh, that we will share with you where you can find that information. Um, and as Kevin said, it's very important to schedule regular um, touch points with your team through conference calls, video conferencing, you know, whatever works for your individual staff members. Um, and I think everybody's hit on this, that it's important to, you know, show understanding and empathy, be flexible, because we're all going through this together and everybody's going to adjust in their own time. Um, so the really good news here, though, is that the publishing business can continue and be successful. And even though we're not all in one physical office location and there will be a period of adjustment, this is likely going to lead to some real and permanent changes in the way we do business. Um, and it might even possibly lead to some cost savings. Um, and with that, I will bring it over to Kev. Hi, everybody. Thank you uh, for letting me join this, this Zoom from our video call. Um, the most I've gone through two of these things in my short lifespan in publishing. I've gone through Sandy and I've gone through 9-11. And I've learned, and our executive team have learned a lot from those two episodes. And now we're going into our third episode. The first thing I would recommend, you got to stay calm, cool, and collective because it will pass. It might take a little bit longer this time than Sandy or or 9-11 that I went through. We've learned that um, we can work all from home as long as we communicate, as long as we use whether it's Skype or whether we use Zoom or whether we have phone calls. We do have a regular um, executive meeting every Wednesday at a certain time to discuss issues that come up during the day with, for our employees or for what's going on in the industry because we have to adjust quickly and fast because the it's like the stock market going up and down every five seconds. Uh, we're adjusting to clients, pushing, you know, whether they're canceling their ads, moving their ads to a different position within the company. So we are very fluid and very lean to move things quickly without having too many red tapes to go through because we're in constant communication with the key people. And we let our key people make the, the decision um, on their own because we just don't want to get tied up into uh, red tape and working for this approval and that approval. So overall, but now as PW is all working from home, we have 41 employees that are working from home. Everybody has a laptop, everybody has access to communication, and whether it's a cell phone or whether it's their laptop, we have Zoom capabilities. We are a weekly publication. We have gotten the weekly publication out during Sandy and 9-11, and we continue to get the print publication out on a weekly basis. We have checked with all our vendors in terms of their status and so far everything is a go. What our big advantage is that we also have not only is a print edition, we have a digital edition that goes to 128,000 people in the industry, which was behind a paywall of, because we are a paid publication. We decided to service the industry by opening up that paywall where anybody in the industry has access to PW's content for the next month or two until things change. We want to keep our clients, we want to keep our readers and um, inform them late breaking news or what's going on in the industry so they're not left. And so that's a, a pretty good part of our digital strategy. Plus we have eight leading newsletters to niche markets that everybody can read for free. So overall, I think we're in a good shape to, to send out information, whether it's in print or digital format, um, but obviously most people are from home. So we're actually, I would assume there'd be an uptake in, in digital readership for publishers weekly or expanding our reader base. 
I'll just give you kind of broad strokes what I'm seeing in the industry right now in terms of, of what publishers are concerned about. As you know, majority of the major trade shows internationally or in the States have been canceled and some are still open for discussion, whether it's Book Expo, whether it's ALA, et cetera, et cetera, what their, you know, what their plans are. We've been in conversations with trade shows about doing virtual trade shows um, to get the message out, to help sell books or help sell rights opportunities. The other opportunity um, that we're doing um, to help the industry, um, we're gonna send out new content because we've learned more about homeschooling now in the last probably month. And we're kind of looking at what Scholastic has been doing to open access for the school markets and the schools and the libraries and uh, bookstores are closing down. You know, the biggest problem I think the industry has in the book publishing industry is that Amazon has kind of diverted all their assets uh, to our distributing more essential goods to the public. So they've come really come out and say they've cut back or stopped delivering books to the industry, which then affects publishers, which affects booksellers. Um, so that is a major concern for a lot of the independent presses and for the major houses. Um, most publishing houses are working from home. Uh, as you know, library, libraries are closed down and schools are being closed down and who knows whether they'll be back in session this year. So there's opportunities for companies to um, help learn for learning aspects uh, of the industry. We are also finding that um, they have their own publishing houses have their strategy. Author tours have been canceled. So I think it's, it's in fluid motion. I don't think, I think there's a strategy out in place, but it's going to take some time to implement their resources and how to divide their resources because um, you know, what do you do when you do have books sitting in a warehouse and you need to get them out in the marketplace? So I think each publishing house has their own strategy. Um, that's what we're seeing. I think there's concern in, in how do independent publishers stay afloat, how do bookstores stay afloat, and I think the industry is starting to rally uh, around supporting each other, which is a good sign. I think you see that on the news now with the Walmarts and the Targets gathering and making sure their stores are stocked with essentials. Um, so that's what I'm saying. It's, it's fluid in motion. We're fluid in motion. We are making changes every 24, 48 hours. We found some new revenue opportunities coming out of this. I think out of, out of this thing, we, we learned more about our company and what other things we can do to support the industry, whether it's free content, editorial content, and stuff like that. You know, our biggest challenge is for us that we're the largest review meeting of books probably in the United States, I would say in the world, we get about a thousand packages a day. Uh, what happens if the office building shuts down um, and we can't get those books into review? We've switched over to e-galleys, which we've been doing for a while, for the last couple of years, which we learned from Sandy and from 9-11. So people can send in digital copies so we can review the books. So the reviews then go out into the marketplace. So we're pretty fluid. Um, we do have hiccups, I'm not lying. Um, <clears throat> try to solve those in a, a, a pretty quick fashion. So I think that's kind of what the industry is looking at, uh, what we've been doing. Um, but I think the most, most important thing is you stay calm, cool, collected, turn off your TV because it's not always positive news and can get you depressed. And I agree, I take a walk every day to get out of my house. Uh, I walk around the block just to get some fresh air and to clear my mind, but you cannot sit at a desk for 10 hours a day. You know, my day starts at eight and probably doesn't end until nine, 10 o'clock at night. So um, I tend to take breaks, you know, connect with family members, make sure they're safe. And I think that takes less stress off of yourself that knowing your family and friends are doing well. So overall, I think we'll get out of this in the next two or three months. It's going to take some time and a filter, but I think people are rearranging all their scheduling and meetings and author tours and getting books into the marketplace. And I think it will all settle out. It's temporary. And um, I think the industry will evolve into something a little bit different than it is today. It's making us forced to think, think differently. And how do we, how do we rely on more digital information going out?
So that's what I have to say. Um, I'll be around for questions. There are any questions, but I thank you for this opportunity. And um, we'll all get through this. I'm very positive I've gone through some of the other situations and it's all good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kev, for sharing your perspective as well as what you're seeing from um, the industry, from publishers large and small. Um, very helpful to know. And actually, I'd like to take this opportunity to bring Kathy in and um, ask what you know what she's seeing, you know, on the ground there with her team from Princeton. Kathy, hello. Um, I. In, in the New Jersey office, which has about 150 staff in it. We also have a UK office with about 15 and a Beijing office with close to 10. So they were obviously hit first and they're now back at work, but our New Jersey and UK offices are been 100% remote now starting on Monday and it will be at least through April 13th. So we planned it about two days before it started and did encounter issues with, um, well, we had some staff who work remotely on a regular basis, one or two days a week anyway, and editors who travel a lot. Then we had some staff who uh, have no internet at home, no computer, not all of them had laptops. So we really scrambled and I think everyone is now set up to work at home. Very fortuitously for us, the press had just switched to Zoom phone right before this hit. So we all have Zoom and it's been evolving in an interesting way with um, an all staff chat that started the very first morning has now brought, broken off into three different voluntary staff chat strings. One is for just fun stuff, parenting tips, inspiration, meditation suggestions that sort of thing one is for book recommendations and i've just myself just started one for a step count challenge because it's like kev was saying it's hard to remember to get up and move around so i need motivation myself and that's been already adopted in the last four hours by 16 people at princeton um Technology-wise, we've faced a few challenges. Some people rely on VPN, which has bandwidth issues. And especially I have three team members who um, are heavy users of Photoshop and Illustrator. So, but so far, so good on that front. We have some staff who uh, have had Zoom issues with connectivity and my IT people are working on that. Uh, and then we have some staff who just are having trouble remembering to open Zoom in the morning and they find all the icons confusing. So we're trying to establish like best practices around having Zoom on is like being in the office and having the green dot is like having your office door open. You should be contactable during office hours. Um, we also use SharePoint. A fair amount. Dropbox is really good. It's much better than VPN. And um, we've also some have some users of Monday.com for complex projects. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about having possible group happy hours or lunches or meditation sessions via Zoom. I have been checking in on my staff as often as once a day especially everyone who hasn't worked from home before or people who live alone or have small children and have uh, just complications with getting it all done. Um, there are some people who are anxious about the virus and some people who are just anxious about change and um, work performance. And I think it can all sort of blend together at times. But luckily for me, we were pretty paperless. Uh, Terry, you were talking about publishers who aren't paperless in their actual workflows, I can see that's even a more massive change. So those are my thoughts at the moment. Thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing uh, what's going on with you and your team and how they're uh, making the transition to being home-based um, sometimes for the first time. Um, 
I just want to just toss a quick note out there before I bring in Rich. Um, you know, if any of the uh, folks listening in have any comments or questions, please submit those through the um, Q and A bar. And um, you know, with that, I'm going to bring Rich in, and he's going to um, he's going to share some tips about remote work requirements and how you can maintain communication with your staff. Rich. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for the time and appreciate Westchester Publishing putting this together. Um, I've been, uh, my first, our first company um, was started, remote company in 1996. So my wife and I had a lot of experience with uh, remote work and career path operates virtually. We have team members on three continents. Um, you know, some home office priorities that I've developed over the years. Um, really important to make sure you have a, an environment that feels good to you. Um, I suggest good light, have music, um, you know, when you're not on conference calls, um, you know, nest a little bit, make it your own, uh, make plants and, and pictures in your space, even if it's a small space in the corner. Uh, the more you can feel comfortable there, the easier it's going to be while you have to work from home. And um, uh, one thing that I always have, it just makes a, my life a lot more um, uh, simple when I'm working is having an extra monitor on my desk um, because it, the computer screen on the uh, laptop can get really small, limit your space and, and get frustrating at times. So just some simple things uh, that we can do to make it um, uh, better. Um, in, re in regards to remote team requirements, um, things that we practice are, um, and this has been mentioned, regularly scheduled check-ins. Um, we really don't do um, random. So people know in my company that I'm available usually from 7.30 in the morning till about 3.30 in the afternoon are my core hours. I'll do a couple calls early uh, with the remote teams overseas and then I get into my production time. And then in the afternoon, I schedule other kinds of calls that need to happen, whether they're partners, investors or clients. So that way I structure my day a little bit. It's not random. Um, I know what's gonna happen and I can plan around it. Um, we maintain deadlines. It's really critical as your team becomes remote and disparate, it's, it's easy to forget that there are deadlines that occur. And so put those into some some of your workforce solutions um, um, and always you know continue to expect excellence from your team just because they're home doesn't mean they can't perform excellent work um, and that can be a dialogue that you have um, and then finally you know change is a constant uh, and adoption is critical and i think we're all learning that lesson um, and it, it can be a very interesting process but it's doable um, the stack that i use for my technology Zoom and Uber conference, they kind of overlap a little bit, but I had an Uber conference line that was a personalized phone number. Um, so we use that quite often to do uh, demos online. We use Slack uh, for communications. Dropbox is a great tool for uh, allowing us to maintain file, files and structure. Uh, Skype, uh, my overseas team likes and prefers Skype and it, it combines the, um, the video conferencing along with the chat function, and we can kind of maintain a running dialogue about certain projects. We use Google Docs quite a bit, and Trello is our project management software. So that's that's our stack of career path. And finally, um, some staying sane items that we talk about. Um, so setting those office hours. Um, and so, uh, and I think Kathy mentioned, you know, having a, kind of a red light, green light making sure people know when your hours are in your family, um, which can be difficult with little kids, um, but you certainly spouses understand uh, your time. Um, you still do have a life, um, you know, figure out it within that structure when you can go out and, and, and take a coffee break or um, I shoot baskets with my boys in the after, uh, around lunchtime sometimes. Uh, you know, get the, getting exercise is, is a really healthy part about working from home. And finally, make sure you have your lunch and your dinner um, and, and enjoy your, um, your time with your family. Uh, this can be stressful, but uh, families can eliminate that stress uh, through the love and the, um, the time together. So I wish you all well, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to um, share some of my learnings over the years. That was awesome, excellent advice. Thank you so much, Rich, for sharing that with us. 
Um, now I'm going to bring on Andy Wilson, who is going to explain how the Dropbox platform can help publishers and their teams share info while they're spread out, whether it's across the country or even around the world. Andy. Hi, thank you ever so much. And I hope you guys can hear me. Uh, as you can probably hear from my voice, I'm not in the US. I'm based in London. And uh, I'm the Global Director of Technology, Media Technology at Dropbox. Uh, so I've worked for about 20 years in, in media, mainly actually in broadcasting. So I worked for the, for the BBC and for feature films like Arvin Features. And now I look after all of our biggest media customers, uh, be they publishers, uh, be they broadcasters, or be they feature film operators. So a whole range there. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is is really some of the things that, that we've learned. So I'm gonna ask if you, can, if you can move on with some of the slides to the next one. Um, so one of the things that we've, uh, we've been really thinking about as we work with lots of companies around the world, and it's great to hear so many uh, Dropbox customers on the line. Thank you all so much. We're working really, really hard at the moment to help support you guys. Uh, and also with uh, lots of new customers that are joining us as well. But when you think about it in the media, actually we've all got used to working very differently to to a lot of traditional companies and from my past you know if i was if i was making a show uh, and some of my colleagues made planet earth 2 for example the penguins rarely want to come to your office or studio to be filmed and so you get very used to having teams all around in very different locations and how you can think about how you communicate them and so i think we're probably set up better than a lot of other industries where we have writers at home we have a supply chain that stretches all across the world and we have to think about how we communicate with those uh, teams. So if we move on, um, and when you think about, particularly in publishing, uh, and Westchester's got you know, businesses in in the US, in the UK, and, and in India, and, and I think that that's you know, really a part of how we all work together. Now, one of our realities is, of course, time zones start to blur, and we start to, get to work together asynchronously. So we have to think about how that works. I'm going to give you a, a couple of examples now. So one is going to be a company that we're working with who uh, they started uh, this business where they want, had this idea that they wanted to build a creative business without bricks and mortars. And they've grown to 500 staff. And I'm going to tell you some of their tips they've given us to share because I think that's really, really exciting. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of the culture of, of that work that we're doing. And then I'm going to tell you a bit about how we work at Dropbox and, and how we've been getting through this as well. So if we move on um, to the next slide, the one of the things that uh, the remote kind of first companies that we work with are telling us is the three C's to have this remote culture. And the first one is is contact. Right. We all love human contact. And in a remote environment, timely responses are really important. But also the company culture is learned top down. So all leaders, we've got to show up and We've got to be active participants and it doesn't matter whether that's zoom chats like we're having now so zoom meetings or whether it's slack channels but the way that you communicate is really embodies your company culture so that's the first one the second one is we've got to start being a bit more transparent with our cal uh, calendars because all of a sudden people will be looking at them a lot more and trying to understand when can they put time in when do you need to block time for yourself to actually get on with the work that you need to do and when is it about contact time and then thirdly is about context. So we're all thrown in at the deep end on projects when we join a company or maybe we're pulled into something. But actually in the virtual world, we really need to understand the why behind every ask. We can't have that across the desk conversation anymore. So we've got to put that time in to make sure that everybody understands those concepts. And in a remote world, we're seeing a lot of pass the parcel going on. Uh, and that's where, where Dropbox, where we typically plug in where you're using, say, Adobe tools and you're working uh, on some InDesign projects, you're then sharing a PDF proof with somebody else. Um, and that's, that's typically where you might see Dropbox in that workflow, where we're holding your, your files on there and then you're sending a PDF and using our preview function where we can preview up to 500 megabytes. So you don't actually have to download that big file. You can just look at it online and we'll give you a preview of that. So you can then select an area and give some feedback. So we've developed some tools that really help to save bandwidth, which I think is a really important thing. And for you guys, it's going to be incredibly important as network congestion might become a little bit more of a, a challenge in the coming weeks as, as broadband speeds go up and down. So I think it's really important to, to have that ability to save some bandwidth. Moving to the next one, I want to talk a little bit more about cultures of different staff members, because when I, when I was at school, and I'm sure the same as you guys, the, the whole thing about teamwork was about, it was embodied by being on the sports field. And, 
for me, that was football. You know, I'm a Brit. That's what it's all about, or soccer, as you guys might call it. Um, but if we move on to the next slide, one of the things about the, some of the newer generations that, that we have at work, they've learned to be really creative. They've learned to solve problems. They've learned to work together online. For them, working virtually is all about how they get things done. So we're seeing this really interesting opportunity for teams to kind of reverse mentor. So typically when you start a new job, you know, someone more experienced in the company comes in and tells you, hey, this is how we do things here. Well, actually, now we've got this amazing young workforce who have learned and trained themselves to work brilliantly like this. So there's a great opportunity for them to then help other workers across your organization to understand how they can get work done in this virtual environment. What works best? What have they learned? What are the tips and tricks? So I, I think there's a real opportunity uh, for people to go up and down within the organization. Um, so if we move on now, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing. So at Dropbox, uh, we've launched a new version of Dropbox, which you can see here. And this is all about keeping you productive and keeping your teams working together on projects. So what you can see is the new Dropbox interface, and that brings together all the tools, tools we've been speaking about. So it integrates with Slack. It integrates with Zoom. Um, at, we've got a Trello integration. So you can start putting all of those, that content into one place. And I think this is really important, starting to bring your tools, your teams and your content all in one place. And as I said before, thinking about how you can do things that makes it easier for people to comment, to give feedback, to sign things off, to share things with third parties who won't have access to the physical media or won't have access to those files. So to invite them into a project and get them to see that. So that's a really important part of it. And Unsurprisingly, um, you know, we use our own tools. So if you're delivering a big audio book or you're making a podcast because you can't get on that audio, uh, you can't get on that book tour that you're going around, maybe you're thinking about new ways to connect with your audience. You can absolutely remotely produce that with your writers, with your authors, with your talent. And you can pull that all together and you can, again, preview that online. You don't have to download the big audio files. You can press play and we'll take care of that conversion. So you can listen back, sign it off, and then distribute it to your readers. So there's lots of different ways that you can use these virtual tools to help you to get your work done. And finally, how are we working at Dropbox? Well, if we move on to the next slide, of course we're using our own tool. That's a big part of what we do. But we also are using Slack and Zoom and we're having a lot of fun with it as well. So we've got a lot of remote workers now. We actually sent all of our staff, all of our staff have been working from home for, for just under two weeks now. Uh, and in Japan, where we have teams, they've been at home for six weeks now. So we've really got some kind of advanced practice in, in how to do this. And you'll see on, on the screen there, some of our teams having a bit of fun, having their, their, their morning coffee chat where they all get together just to start the day and to connect people, having a bit of fun with the, the backgrounds there. You know, everybody loves to remember that BBC News interview where the kids run in and uh, have a, their own guest star appearance in that. And I think that's one of the things I want to leave you with is that we've all got families, they're all going to be around us. And what's really happening and what we're seeing is a real hum humanity and a real humility towards that as well about people just having fun. When the kids wander in, they're going to do it. So just make the most of it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to taking your questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andy, for sharing um, how uh, your teams are responding to the challenges that are out there now and how Dropbox has the tools to help us all respond to it. Um, I'm going to bring in Michael now, and he's going to offer up some perspective, and then we're going to get to the Q&A. So um, if any questions, if you have any questions, you know, please submit them in, and we'll get to as many as time allows us to. Michael? Hey there. Hi guys. What a time we're living in, eh? It's just a, amazing that we're that this has come upon us so quickly. Now, no doubt you um, you all are familiar with the trope that IT folks tend to be warm and, and fuzzy and all about emotional engagement, right? Um, so <laughs> let me start with talking about social distancing. That's the, 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 the term du jour. I want to make sure that we separate that from physical dis distancing because the danger is physical proximity, not the social spirit. One of the things that we've been working really hard to do is to make sure that we are maintaining those social dynamics through these technologies that are, are being discussed. And we all will need to consciously, even artificially, construct social engagement mechanisms for the duration to keep us all sane as we, as we all work from home. We've heard from these panelists on technologies and approaches, and of course, 
what works for your team may be different from what works for ours or, or theirs. But um, overall, I think we just need to be mindful to, to construct opportunities for remote socializing. Uh, sharing lunchtime chat on Zoom as has been described. Having routine brief check-in calls routinely, daily. It's not all about work. It's also about the human connections. Uh, be sure to thank your staff. This is so important. Thank your staff for their participation and your, thank your supervisors and your IT people for the work they're doing. Continue to acknowledge that we're all in this together and that it's hard and that we're continuing to learn. We are all in this together. So let's keep finding ways to stay social, even as we find ways to keep getting the work done remotely. So we've gotten some questions, um, and I'll read them out and call on some panelists. If somebody really wants to leap in uh, with an answer, that's, that's fine too. Um, so there was one that I wanted to make sure that Andy had a chance to um, answer. Are there measures put in place to ensure data security and confidentiality? And maybe talk about that from Dropbox's point of view, mm -hmm. Andy. Yeah, abs absolutely. So as you'd imagine, the security is our number one priority at Dropbox. And we work really hard to make sure that we keep all of your content secure. So. Uh, all of the content is encrypted uh, and it's distributed across our stack, so how we save it. And, and that data is only available to people that you choose for it to be available to. So we make sure that we use industry-leading encryption technologies and we keep all of that data secure in the Dropbox data centers. At a user end, uh, obviously you can enforce things like um, two-factor authentication to make sure that your users are staying nice and secure and they're not sharing information. And we have full admin tools so that you can make sure you control access to that. So I think security is absolutely uh, uh, inherent and one of the most important parts of our platform. So I'd say that I, I'm, I'm not concerned about how the security is. What I, what I would say to, to any users uh, thinking about moving there is about how they can empower their teams to work together remotely in a secure way. And I think as some of the, the panelists have said earlier, that's all about rethinking the workflows that you have to make sure that you're securely sharing with individuals. Sometimes that means making things view only. So people have to go online and read them in a browser. I know for some people that's not an optimal way of, of receiving it, but mm -hmm. it prevents people from downloading. If you, are, if you have concerns about sharing material with individuals and allowing them to download mm -hmm. it, load it. So you can make sure you put in place controls and again, it's the same for, for podcasts, webinars. Again, you can put in place those controls. People can only stream it, listen to it online, but not download it. So think about the controls you want to put in place, work out your workflow, but absolutely we'll make sure we can secure it. Thank you very much. And this was probably for Kev um, to start off with at least. Um, I work for an association press. Leaders want to downplay marketing books because people don't have money right now. This is a sad time, et cetera but the press is one of the few revenue generating departments in the organization and we need revenue. Any tips for battling this don't sell anything culture? Well, I don't really believe that's to, uh, not the sell, not the market. I think people will in for their free time that they have, they will turn back to reading and they'll turn back to other social engagements. I think, um, if you shut down completely, um, you're going to have a ramp up time to get books back into market. I actually answered that question last night to one of my clients that they wanted to cut their whole program. And they said, well, why don't you we sat down? We talked about the release of their books when the books are coming out. I, I, you know, they can switch from, from print if they're doing print into digital opportunities with whether it's with PW or some other publication out there. I think, you know, if you work smartly and, and, and continue to support your authors and continue to support your program, I think is important. I, I think there's always going to be money for purchasing things. And, and this is an inexpensive leisure goods besides your TV and Netflix and who mm -hmm. is looking to do that. I spend $5.99 a month to do it. So, you know, content is important. And I think it's how you deliver the message and how you say you're, you're, you have you have opportunities, and I think if you just yeah. shut down completely, one hundred percent, you're gonna have when this market turns, it can turn very quickly, 
and then you're going to be behind the eight ball. All you know, what I'm seeing from publishers, they're just adjusting their time frame or releases of books. They're still marketing their titles out there through whether it's social media, whether it's through um, you know their own digital platforms. Um, I haven't yeah. seen right now a significant downturn in our revenue. Yes, we have had cancellations. We have movements. Um, but it's it's in fluid motion. I would just think about what what your budget is and how do you how to get the best out of your dollars, whether it's social media, whether it's digital. Sure, uh, librarians yeah. and booksellers are still going to read your trade magazines and they're still working from home, even though the distribution process may be slowed down a little bit. But when they're ready to ramp up, they're going to ramp up. And Great. you don't want to miss that move. It's like missing the move in the market. People now selling out because <laughs> you know, they're all freaking yeah. out because there goes their 401ks. Um, you just got to figure Hold out the what course. the ideas yep. and your tactics is and, and move forward. All right. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, another question is, uh, has come in um, that I think Kevin in, in Dayton could answer. A lot of our staff have kids who are home from school right now. What, are, what ways are you working with your team members around the reality of the likely distractions they have due to that? Kevin? Kevin? Kevin from me or Kevin from? Kevin Gray. Kevin Gray. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's me. Uh, it's I, I had forgotten I had muted on the app. Uh, that, that's a good question and I'm dealing with myself. Um, I have a, a fiance who's working from home and a whole host of kids here. Um, you know, part of it is making sure everyone has their own workspace to work in. Um, but part of it is just an acceptance of we're all kind of in this together. And, and particularly those of us with, with little kids or those of you who have little kids, um, you know, kind of having an awareness that, yeah, they might walk into the room and, and interrupt occasionally. And that's, we're all kind of in that boat. Um, the, the other thing is, you know, thinking about what it means for a work day. I mean, most of us are used to kind of segmenting our home and our, on our personal lives. So you go into the office, you work your, you know, set number of hours, then you come home. Um, you know, what I have found, particularly when I was working for a moment, I had little kids is that maybe you do take a half an hour out in the middle of the day to, you know, do something with your kids to give them the attention they need and then come back on and, and work a bit later, uh, later on. Um, I mean, really an important thing to remember here is it's not about the time anyone's putting in. It's about what are the objectives you need to, them to accomplish mm. and then giving them the space and the support to accomplish those. Which, which really addresses a, another question that's come up, which is how do you keep tabs on employees to ensure they're performing? And you're, you're more or less saying make sure that you set objectives and major progress. Yep. It's not about the hours that are logged or the continuousness of the hours. It's more getting the job done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, for us, we work with, um, we work with a lot of freelancers in addition to staff. And so in, in some ways, um, there's not a lot of difference from the way you interact with a freelancer on a day to day basis, as you do with a remote employee, um, make sure they know what you're expecting of them, um, that they have an opportunity to ask questions and, and to clarify whatever might be needed, that they understand what the, the due dates are. Um, and that they have a communication channel. Uh, I mean, obviously, staff employees are different than freelancers in that they are they have an investment with the organization, so you do need to be mm -hmm. mindful of that. But but by and large, it's it's not about you know working the clock. It's about making sure that you as a manager have an understanding of what your employee is capable of doing, what's a reasonable amount of time, and then setting those expectations and then um, helping them, supporting them so that they can deliver to them. Right, good, good. Uh, if um, I could just jump in uh, real sure. quick, this is Rich. Um, uh, just having witnessed, my wife worked in pr uh, publishing for uh, 25 years for Scholastic and other publishers and, and building books uh, as a designer and new product developer. And um, what you just said is really important, having clear expectations for your workers. Uh, her best bosses have always been the people who set clear expectations on a weekly basis. They didn't care how often or how long she worked, as long as the expectations were met. But what I saw on my end was, you know, a diligent worker, someone who got things done because she knew 
exactly what was expected of her. And so as you're going through this, make sure you lay those out on a weekly basis. You know, here's what we're doing. Here's how we're going to meet the final deadline to the publisher and what we need to do. Um, and, 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 and then have those review sessions. So you stay on task, but, um, you know, people will work the hours they work, you know, and some people will flex to say, you know, their husband's going to work. So they're going to work at night or, or, uh, you know, my wife's working. So I'm going to work first thing in the morning, whatever their schedule is, you have to be adaptive, but you still have to hit your deadline. So set out the expectations and let people lose. Great. Thanks so much for all those in, insightful answers. There are, there are more questions, but we will try to address them and include them in, um, in what we send out. Um, it, it is, however, quite a bit past what our target for the duration of this, uh, of this web, webinar. So back to you, Nicole. Uh, yes, thank you so much, um, Michael, for all you know for all for taking all those questions in. Thank you to our panelists, both for um, sharing your time, your insights, and answering the uh, questions we got from the attendees. We got a really lot of great questions, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but we will answer them after this webinar. And um, what we have also done. Uh, in addition, is we have gathered several resources. You'll see some of them here, and uh, they'll be included in, in the information we send out to you later on. Um, you know, things that you can use or share with your teams, you know, to help everybody get used to what is our new current reality. Um, you know, so we hope that all this information that you heard here today from our panelists, as well as the resources that we're going to share, we hope that's all helpful for you. And um, I just I just want to say in closing that, you know, Westchester Publishing is here to help our clients and colleagues in the publishing industry as we get used to the current circumstances. And um, you are free to reach out to me at your convenience with any questions or comments, whether it's about today's discussion or something else entirely. Um, and again, you don't need to worry about jotting down my email. I will be sending this out in the presentation uh, later on. So um, thank you again for everybody joining us today. Um, continue to be well, and we hope to connect with you soon. Thank you. Thanks a Thank lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.